In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rallying the troops. Uh, back here in Philippians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 4 with me once again if you would. Verse number 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Now, we saw last Wednesday evening how that Paul, in verses 1, 2, and 3, how that he challenged the Philippian believers to stand fast in the Lord. And remember, we said that that phrase, stand fast, it was an illustrative type phrase. It was a phrase that ultimately uh, would cause the reader, especially if they were from the first century, to think of soldiers who were standing at attention, standing arm in arm as an army getting ready to go forward into battle. And that's what he was telling them to do, was to stand united and to be ready to go forward for the cause of Christ. And remember that in our study we saw that his, uh, his motivation to them for doing this was the fact that Jesus Christ's return was getting near, as he mentioned in verses 20 and 21 of chapter number 3. And then he specifically pointed out to them how that there were two in the church uh, that did not have the mind of Christ. In verse number 2, he mentioned Unius and he mentioned uh, Syntyche and how that they had some type of an issue, some type of uh, a problem. It's not uh, a described for us here, except to say that they did not have the same mind in the Lord. And so he then challenged these believers to go ahead and stand back in the Lord by first off being humble. If these men, Unius and Syntyche, could put aside their pride and could have the mind of the Lord and have the mind of Christ, which is a mind of humility, then they could help their church go forward and, and help the, the work of the Lord go forward. But if they would be lifted up and continue to be lifted up in pride and have some type of a dispute, whether it be with each other or someone else in the church, they were going to cause an issue in that church that would keep that church from going forward or from standing fast as he instructed them to do in verse number 1. And then the second thing he told them to do was to be helpful. Stand fast by being helpful. In verse number 3, he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel. And he challenges them to work together and to all be helping in the ministry. So to be humble and to be helpful, and if they would do these two things, be humble, humble individually, be helpful individually, then collectively, they as a church would be able to stand fast, stand uh, firm, stand solid, and go forward for the cause of Christ. Now, we get down to verse number 4 that I just read to you. Now we see Paul rallying the troops with three thoughts. The first thought being found here in verse number 4, the second found in verse 5, and then the third thought found in verses 6 and 7. He tries to rally them now. Now that he's addressed the weaknesses of the church, the fact that there were some that were not humble, there were some that were not helpful, he now tries to rally the troops and tries to encourage them and to challenge them, uh, to edify them with these words found in verses 4 through 7. First off, he talks about rejoicing in verse number 4. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, he wrote. The Apostle Paul here implored the Philippian believers to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoicing is the act of expressing joy or gladness. When a person rejoices, what they're doing is they're expressing outwardly what they have inwardly. In order for a person to express joy, he must first possess joy. The Bible clearly teaches that true joy, true gladness, is not something that man can manifest on his own. It is something given by God to men through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. In Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 26, we're not going to turn over there, but you may write that down to read later on. It says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight these things. 
wisdom and knowledge and joy. God is the giver of true joy. In Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 22, we have the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. The second uh, 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 in that list of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. God is the giver of true joy, and He gives this joy to believers through the Holy Spirit of God. This is what Paul was alluding to when he wrote here, verse number 4, Rejoice in the Lord. The Bible teaches that when a person receives Jesus Christ as a Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside him. His body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. It becomes ultimately the housing for the Holy Spirit. We know this from 1 Corinthians 6.19, where Paul wrote you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. As a result of having the Holy Spirit in his heart or in his life, this new believer experiences and enjoys the love of God, the joy of God, and the peace of God. As this believer yields himself to the Holy Spirit to do the will of God, the Father, the fruit of the Spirit's power, the fruit of the Spirit's influence in his heart and in his life is more evident. Let me illustrate to you tonight using this glass of water. We're going to say that this glass of water is the life of an individual. And that this uh, food coloring here is representative of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. Now, when a person receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God comes into their hearts and in, into their life and indwells them. And they become the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, as I just mentioned to you. And so the Holy Spirit influences them. The Holy Spirit, His power is noticeable in their life. But if that, they want to see the Holy Spirit's power uh, be more influential or more evident in their life, and they want to see the fruit of the Spirit in their life, then what they need to do is yield to the Holy Spirit. So as this new believer gets up in the morning and purposes that they're going to spend time in God's Word before they go off to work, and they sit down and they open their Bible and they read their Bible and they study it and they glean something from it, then the Holy Spirit of God, His power uh, goes through them and fills them, and then His, uh, His influence on their life is more evident. As they take time and they pray, uh, as they're going off to work, and as they're at work throughout the day, and ask God for His help, and ask the Holy Spirit for His leading and His direction, the Holy Spirit's power, once again, is added to their life and is more evident. As they go to the water cooler there at their workplace, and people are telling uh, off-color jokes, and they purpose, they're not going to listen to it. They're going to walk away. The Holy Spirit's power is once again in their life and is evidence. As they go home and they decide that they're going to have family altar, they're going to have devotions, they're going to turn off the TV before they go to bed and spend some time in God's Word, then the Holy Spirit once again is, uh, enters in and empowers them. And you can see how that the more that the Holy Spirit is involved in a person's life, the more evident it is in their life. Well, just as a person yields to the Holy Spirit of God and He fills them and He, he gives them this filling, it is evident through the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on and so forth. So a person who is filled with the Spirit and who is yielding to the Spirit will have the fruit of the Spirit. And it will be noticeable to everyone around them that this person is the fruit of the Spirit. Now let me illustrate real quickly for you the opposite. Here you have the person that has not yet been converted, but they get converted, they accept Christ as Savior. And so once again, it is evident that the Holy Spirit is inside them. And He is having influence on them. Now the influence of the person who uh, just newly gets saved, but has not been yielding, or has not yielded to the Holy Spirit, and the influence is not as noticeable, the influence of the Holy Spirit on his life, as it is on the person who is yielding to God. And so this new believer, instead of yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, instead of getting up and reading his Bible, and spending time in prayer, and walking away from the water cooler, and turning off the television, he decides to go ahead and do the things that please 
please him. And he decides to go ahead and ultimately feed his flesh. And as he does, what happens is the power of the Holy Spirit in his life is watered down. It's not as noticeable as it is in the person who is yielding over and over to the Holy Spirit of God. So here in this passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4, when Paul tells these believers to rejoice in the Lord, ultimately what he is telling them to do is to possess joy. And then express that joy. And the only way to possess joy is by yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. And if they yield to the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will fill them and they will have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Now, look back at verse number 4, because if you remember back to our study before in chapter number 3 and verse number 1, Paul already gave this instruction to the believers at Philippi to rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 3, verse 5, remember it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. But here in chapter 4 and verse 4, there's a word added to this instruction or to this challenge. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, we know what that word always means. We understand that word, even though we don't say always. We, we say the word always. But our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, probably defined this word for us better than we could define it this evening. In His challenge to the disciples to go preach the gospel in Matthew chapter number 28, that this is the great commission that He gave to them in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. In verse number 20, after he told them to go and preach and to baptize and to teach, he then says in verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Just as the Lord promised his disciples that he would be with them unto the end of the world, or he would be with them always, here, the believers in Philippi were challenged by Paul to rejoice always, or even into the end of the world. In other words, we should always be rejoicing. That's what Paul was telling these believers. Rejoice always. Rejoice in the good times. Rejoice in the bad times. Just simply rejoice in God. Find joy in God. Find joy by having the Holy Spirit of God uh, filling you and, 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 and inside you and you healing Him. You be full of joy and that will cause you to rejoice no matter what situation you're in. Whether you're in a trial or you're in a trial, you can rejoice. And that's what He challenges these believers to do. To rejoice in the Lord always. But then notice at the end of verse number 4. He then says, and again I say, rejoice. Now, he already said in chapter 3, verse number 1, to rejoice in the Lord. Now here in chapter 4, verse number 4, he says it again, rejoice in the Lord. And then that word always is added to help them understand that the duration of rejoicing is never ending. That you're always supposed to rejoice, no matter what comes your way. But then here at the end of verse number 4, another phrase is added on. And again, I say, rejoice. This was added to show the importance of rejoicing. The importance of rejoicing is noted by Nehemiah, the man whom we spent most of last year studying. Remember after the walls had been rebuilt and the gates had been reconstructed, how the Jews in the area were called together by Nehemiah for an assembly. At that meeting, Ezra, the scribe, stood up and read the law of the Lord to the people. When they heard the words of the law and realized that they had been transgressing against God, the people began to weep, seeing that the people's hearts had been smitten and that they were sensitive to following the words of the Lord. Nehemiah stood up in Nehemiah 8 and verse number 10 and said these words, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Paul knew that joy given by God 
with strength for the believer. Tonight, God wants us, just as He wanted the Philippians, and just as Paul wanted the Philippians, God wants us to rejoice, to find joy in serving Him, and find joy from ultimately being connected to Him, and to express this joy, to rejoice. To rejoice in the good times and the bad times. To rejoice so no matter who gets elected this fall in November. And to, to rejoice no matter what our position might be at work. But to rejoice, to have joy in our hearts and our lives. Why? Because joy and the joy that is given by God is strength to us. It helps us. When everybody else is defeated and discouraged, the joy of the Lord is our strength and it helps us to press on. Not only is it strength to us, but Paul knew that the joy given by God, the rejoicing that these Philippians would be involved in, would help strengthen other believers. That's why he said, if you look back to Philippians 3, 1, why he said immediately after the instruction to rejoice in the Lord, he says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you... It is safe. He says, I'm telling you here, Luke chapter 3, verse 2, uh, 1, to rejoice in the Lord because it's safe for you. It is your strength. And not only is it your strength, your uh, rejoicing in the Lord will strengthen others. Then the second thing that he talks about here in verse number 5, when he's trying to rally the troops, is restraining. He says in verse 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Paul takes rallying the Philippians together, these spiritual soldiers, and reminds them to rejoice in the Lord and to never let there be an end of their rejoicing and to let there never be an end of their joy that's found in God and that's given to them from God. But then he moves on in verse 5 and talks about restraining or restraint. In verse 5, he says, let your moderation be known. Ultimately here, Paul knew that the enemies of rejoicing would attack. That they were already attacking and they would continue to attack these believers as they drew closer and closer to God, the one who would give them true joy. And so here he tells them, let your moderation be known. Unto all men. The word moderation is only used once in the Bible, and it means this. Now, this is no Webster's definition, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you plain 21st century English, alright? To keep a due mean between extremes or excess. In other words, moderation is when a person restrains himself. He may be restraining himself from violent passions, or he may be restraining himself from indulging in his appetite. A classic biblical example of moderation is found in the book of Genesis. Hold your place here and turn back to Genesis chapter number 13 with me if you would real quickly. Genesis chapter number 13 and verse number 8. Now here in Genesis chapter number 13 there was, a, there was strife between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. Because there was not enough pasture for all of their flocks and their cattle. When Abraham heard of the strife he went to his nephew Lot and talked to him. In verse number 8, or verses 8 and 9, we have the words of Abraham recorded for us. It says, And Abraham, or Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt part to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham, here in this story, had every right to tell Lot and his herdsmen to stand down. <clears throat> After all, in the previous chapter, in Genesis 12, the Bible tells us that the Lord called Abraham to leave his country. He didn't call Lot to leave his country. God called Abraham. Lot and his herdsmen were simply tagging along with Abraham and enjoying the blessings of being near this godly man and his family. Instead of getting lifted up in pride and losing his temper, Abraham restrained himself and allowed Lot to choose which land 
He would settle it. Restraint or moderation is a godly characteristic. While the word moderation is only used once in the Bible, the word temperance, which is a synonym for moderation, is used three times. One of these three times is in the list of the fruit that the Holy Spirit of God produces in the life of a Christian, recorded there in Galatians chapter number 5. So Paul instructed the Philippians back here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 5 to be moderate. To let their moderation be known. And you notice how he says, let it be known unto all men. He was instructing them to be moderate, to show restraint, uh, because unbelievers and believers alike were watching them. In the story of Abraham and Lot, we're told in verse number 7 of Genesis 13 that the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. It's highly likely that these two groups of people, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, heard about the dispute between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. These two men were wealthy in flocks and in cattle, and as I already mentioned, uh, they had so much cattle and so much as far as flocks are concerned that the land could not contain both of them. So these two men were very wealthy. It would be hard for uh, the people, uh, the Canaanite people and the Parasite people, not to hear about a rift between the two of these men. Even in those days, when they didn't have social media, and they didn't have newspapers, and they didn't have television, still, they would hear about this rift. The strife between the herdsmen would have been magnified if Abraham had chosen not to exercise moderation or restraint. <coughs> One preacher said this, If the conflict between the two groups of herdsmen was a bad testimony to the Canaanites and the Perizzites, then Abraham's solution, which was moderation, then Abraham's solution was a good testimony to them. In verse number 2 of our text, Paul addressed these two individuals that I already mentioned to you, who did not have the mind of Christ, who did not have the same mind. They were obviously not on the same page. They were not on the same page as the other believers in that church. If these two believers did not choose to exercise moderation or restraint, then those unbelievers in Philippi who were born in this church would see and would be pushed further away from the Lord. Well, fellow believers in the church go off with the Lord. So Paul challenges the troops here. He challenges these uh, spiritual soldiers to be known unto all men. That person a piece of my mind. Before you give them a piece of your mind, remember that you are representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Your Savior. And you're representing your church. And so when you give them a piece of your mind, no matter how big or how little that might be, when you give them a piece of your mind, all of them are influential or positive. Remember that. Let your mind make a moderation be known unto all men. And then notice what he says in verse number 5. The Lord is at hand. At the end of this verse, all the mind of the church are filled the Lord is at hand. And that they be united in exercising restraint or moderation in their lives. Before we move on to the last point, let me make one final notation about this thought the Lord is at hand. Think about it. Paul's writing this in the first century. If the century thought the return was at hand, how close is the Lord's return 2,000 years later? 2016. He's within. If he believed it was at hand 2,000 years ago, how close is it today? It's probably at fingertips length away. With that in mind, we as Christians need to be challenged to rejoice anytime to ourselves. To show my lives. The last thing he puts out in verses 6 and I'll be brief with this is relinquishing. He talks about relinquishing the responsibility of the cares of this life. He says in verse number 6, Be careful for nothing.
clean. In other words, he didn't want the believers at Phil High to be burning down, to be full of care, but rather he wanted them to share their cares, to share their burdens with the one who could help bear them. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7, Peter and the believers in the first century told them the same thing that Paul told the Philippians, only he words. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The followers want to illustrate this truth by a preacher who said, a couple who did a lot of entertaining in their home had a little boy. Usually visitors would acknowledge him by pressing a few coins into his hand. These small gifts he put into his money box. One day uh, a guest seemed to be unaware of his social courtesy customarily extended to the child. So the boy fetched his money box from his room and rattled in front of the visitor. The expected contribution was supplied. The father took the boy aside and said this to him. Son, you are never again to ask a stranger for anything. You are to ask me. I'll never tell you all for asking me. And he added at the end, because I'm your dad. We are instructed to cast all our care upon Him, for He cares for us. Why? Because He's our Heavenly Father. We should not be going to strange God, asking strange God for help, when we have the one true God, our Heavenly Father, that we can go to for. And here, verse number 6, Paul says, Be careful for nothing. Don't take the care of this life upon yourself and try to bear it in yourself, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, who is your heavenly Father. Paul went on to explain to the Philippians how they could let God help them carry their burdens. He told them to simply take their request to God with a thankful heart, a thankful spirit, and to do it in one of two forms, either through prayer or through supplication. Now, while prayer and supplication are similar, there is a distinction between the two. Prayer is the act of asking for a favor, while supplication is earnest prayer. Let me illustrate it this way. If you needed a few dollars and you came up and said, Preacher, could I borrow a few dollars because I want to get a hamburger at McDonald's? That would be prayer. That's asking for a favor. But if you came up and said, Preacher, can I have $200? I need to pay my electric bill. I, I need to pay it tomorrow. That is supplication. Because you have a bigger need. And you are going to, uh, God not just simply asking for a favor, but you are going to Him earnestly, pleading with Him, begging with Him for His help. We ask God for a favor every day. Keep me safe as I go to work. Keep me safe as I go to the store. Keep me safe as I go to school. That's prayer. But at other times, we beg and plead with God, please heal my husband. Heal my wife. Heal my sister. Heal my grandparent. And we supplicate to Him. Paul says, hey, relinquish all those cares to God. Let Him help you carry those cares, those burdens. Go to Him in prayer. Go to Him in supplication. Have a thankful heart. It's so often that uh, people go to God and they go to Him in the wrong spirit or with the wrong spirit. If we will go to Him thanking Him and being truly thankful and pray to Him and supplicate to Him, hey, He will gladly take those burdens and those cares and put them upon Himself. In verse number 7, we're told the result in the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We'll be able to enjoy the peace of God. So in closing tonight, Paul tells these believers, as he rallies them together, he says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, restrain yourself. Show some moderation. And then last, he says, relinquish all those cares. Give them all to God. Go to Him in prayer. Go to Him through supplication. And leave it with Him. Some final words from the Apostle as he rallies these troops before he gives them, them his closing statements. Let's go Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for all that You know for us. Thank You for all that You've given to us. Lord, I pray that You'd help us tonight to focus in our hearts.